God's Bad Boy, James Blake and the System. This book, written by a former college professor and dean about, I'm not going to tell you more right now, except to say that you will see and hear from the bad boy himself in a short while, and why he got that name. You have just enough time to get on the phone and tell two of your best friends to switch to this channel. Also in this program, two years free community college tuition for students. President Obama says that's what he wants, to lower the cost of community college to zero. Dr. Harry Good, Enrollment Management Specialist at Kingsborough Community College, will be joining me shortly as Brooklyn 45 begins the first of two programs to examine the impact of this plan and what it can have on student performance. So let's go to God's Bad Boy, a book about real situations faced by so many kids some of whom grow up to encounter issues of a different kind as adults. Let me welcome the author, Dr. Bessie Blake, and the bad boy himself, Professor James Blake. Thank you. I don't intend to give away the interesting and often provocative details on this book, but there are several points that are just begging to be discussed. So let me begin by asking you in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Dr. Blake, why did you name this book God's Bad Boy? Well, the operative word there is bad boy. Bad boy. And it's a, a label that he got very early on uh, when he was a, around nine, ten years old, when he wasn't conforming to uh, actually the child welfare system that he got caught up in when his family uh, kind of disintegrated. And um, the God part of it is through the various experiences that he had in children's home and in foster care, he grew up to be a person who had a heart for young people and was considered a troublemaker because he dared advocate for young people he would stand up for them and just continue to struggle until he got results. And one day I was on my way to church with my daughter, and he was out doing some community activism. And I said to her, you know what? Your daddy is a bad boy. Hmm. And she said, yes. And then I kind of laughed and said, but he's a good bad boy because he's is doing such a the... Thing? Well, yes, he was, he was doing the work that uh, we are told as Christians that we should do. Mm -hmm. We should help those who are homely, ho uh, homeless, you know, yeah. feed the hungry, yes. assist those who are in trouble. Mm -hmm. So good boy, bad boy, yes. God's bad boy. <laughs> bad boy, your life crashed at a very early age. Yes, Talk about that crash. Well, it was a, an experience that uh, actually changed the whole course of my life at a very er early age. I uh, witnessed a, the tragic, uh, 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 my mother jumping from a window while I was playing in a, a, in a, uh, with some kids. And when she jumped, it was like, it was like slow motion. And I watched her as she descended uh, towards the ground. And when she hit the ground, it was like the whole world crushed because up until that point, I was a very happy kid playing stickball and volleyball and Johnny Ride the Pony, all the street games that New York kids uh, uh, play. Uh, but when she had that un unfortunate, tragic uh, uh, jump, uh, my whole family crushed to the ground because mothers are so key to the family. And she and was out. You're, you didn't have a relationship with, well, you had a relationship, but you didn't have a relationship with your father. That's correct. You know, he was in and out of the house, and yes. he had uh, developed, you know, other uh, family relationships other than, uh, even though we were like the primary family, but he had developed other family relationships. So I didn't have that constant and consistent presence of a father in the house. 
so that whole experience uh, sensitized me without even realizing at that point to the pain of family disintegration and also the need, the co absolute critical need for families to work to strengthen those families because the outcome of a weak family is devastating to a child. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people who obviously you are in contact with uh, who have this kind of reality? There is no man in the home. Their, their father has disappeared. Uh, the mom has got a struggle. Right. What, yeah. what, what, what well, I, uh, it's, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm often in the presence of, of uh, a lot of, especially young black men, uh, who don't have a father, who didn't have a father, who didn't have that influence, as black uh, girls as well. Uh, what I say to them basically is that, after a long discussion, is that the way I look at it is this. I'm not responsible for the family that I come into the world. They're there, you know. That's just the reality. However, I am responsible for the family that I bring into the world. And I say to them that if the pain and the suffering that you felt as a child, mm -hmm. you would not want to have your child have that same kind of experience. You have some control over the kind of experience your child would have but you didn't have control over your experience, but you don't have to duplicate that. Mm -hmm. before, I, before I get back to you, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask you one other question from sure. the book, of mm -hmm. course. You spent a lot of your life in a shelter. Mm -hmm. Talk about, and please, please come in at, at, mm -hmm. as okay. well, because I you will. wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about that real life in a shelter, and, and that is such a reality still today. Yeah for so many kids. Right, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The being in a shelter, and actually I went into a shelter thinking I was gonna be there for two weeks because my father was gonna get somebody to come and help watch the children because my mother had been hospitalized by that time. Two weeks turned out to be, you know, years, <laughs> okay. And uh, the shelter experience, uh, in a nutshell, was a challenging experience for me as a young person because you have to fight for your own individuality. In a shelter, you are a children's home, we would say. The system tries to get you to respond and behave according to the dictates of the system. And you are considered a good child if you leave or, or abandon your own individuality and become part of a group. And uh, that was a very difficult thing for me to do. And that's another reason why God's bad boy, you know, is a proper title. Because I refused and encouraged other kids in, in the uh, shelter, don't lose who you are. Just because we're in this children's home doesn't mean that we don't have an identity outside of this home. And that created problems in terms of not adjusting or conforming mm -hmm. to the rules and regulations of this institution. In fact, you uh, spent some time on the street. Fortunately, <laughs> you, you did not lose yourself. Right. But you spent some time on the street. Yes, a lot of time. You found a gun. Yeah. <laughs> you found a gun in your... My brother. In your brother's... Yes. Uh, your father, in of course. Yeah, in yeah, the I, basement. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, again, when the family disintegrated, uh, you're kind of pushed out into the street and mm -hmm. you look for family outside of your family. Yes. And the family can come in, in the t terms of gangs and mm -hmm. you know other uh, 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 people that kind of respond to you in a way in which you feel that you're getting the kind of love outside of the family that you don't have inside of the family. So yes, I was involved in gang, gang activities. My brother was involved with that as well. Uh, you know, we were just young and just looking for love, like most of the kids out there. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, we got into, you know, difficulties and... Uh, so you were looking for love, that's where you got into a gang. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Because the gang was sort of like the, 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 the circle that uh, protected you, uh, respected you, uh, valued you, uh, and made you feel mm -hmm. that you were something, mm -hmm. you know, other than 
you know, what you thought. So And and you, you know. were looking to belong. Yeah, yeah. You absolutely. Know, because living in the shelter and in the children's home there was not this individualized attention. Mm -hmm. um, he once described it like being a, a widget on an assembly line. And so that there was not mentoring, it was not recognizing him as an identity yeah. mm -hmm. that's individual. Right. Yeah. And so I mean you get up every morning uh, and somebody tells you when you're gonna eat, when you're gonna play, mm -hmm. what you're gonna Everything do. There was an activity did. sheet. You had no I don't feel like going to the movies today. Too bad. We all go to the movies, Blake. At least you got to go to the movies and mm -hmm. at least you got something to eat. And what what I found fascinating <laughs> in, in this book also, but the many things yeah. you, you got to you got to meet the great the great the great Louis Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I sure did. Well, actually, well, I didn't but even he know he was Louis Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he fed you. He yeah. fed me. Yes. He gave me a, my first silver dollar I got from Louis Armstrong. But I that, hope you still have it. I, but that I wasn't, wish I did. <laughs> that wasn't from being in the system. Yeah. At, or, or in a children's home. That was before the children's right. home. Right. Yeah. He was, Louis Armstrong was his next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in Corona, Queens. And so that's how he got to know Louis Armstrong and have Aunt Lucille make those wonderful meals. Right, and we referred to him not as Louis Armstrong, but Pops. Mm -hmm. right. We all knew him in the neighborhood as Pops, Pops. you know. Mm -hmm. Played his trumpet, uh, he uh, interacted with us, but I didn't know him as Louis Armstrong until much no. later. Now before we get to the author, before we really get to the author, I want to, I want to get to the point where you are in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in the book, uh, the author refers to you as, in college, poor, college, but destitute. Talk about that experience. Well, I was not just destitute. I was, as I tell my students, I wasn't poor. I was poor. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, yes. it's a little different, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, uh, and, but my spirit was was rich because yes. I was experiencing things I had never, ever experienced before. And First you of all, I went to, yes, go on. I went to a black college. I didn't even know there were black colleges when I graduated from high school here in New York because I never had a black teacher. I did not even know that there were black people who were college professors, black people who had achieved such distinction because I never was exposed to that. So when I got the opportunity to go to a black college, and I have to say, you know, kids who are in foster care, I'm a perfect example of what they can become mm -hmm. if given the opportunity for an education. Of course. I went to this black college and I was floored. I was absolutely in heaven. Yeah. And I met some of the greatest scholars you can ever meet. And you met a wonderful woman in college. Who ran for me, <laughs> who ran for me, who gave me uh, the most difficult time I ever had because I never had problems with women before. I was a pretty good looking guy. I was the smooth talker, right? He had That's a, his side of the story. Let he, me hear yours. Well, he had a problem with women. He had too many women. <laughs> <laughs> but you eventually said yes. Yes. And uh, reached a point where you became so involved in his life that you decided that it's time to write about this bad boy. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about the reason why you decided to write this book. Well, first of all, at the time when I decided to write the book, um, we'd been married for 45 years. Hmm. And so I had lived his journey with okay. him yes. over the course of that time. And I knew his story better than anyone and there was always someone coming to him saying, you know, uh, I'm doing a book and uh, Blake, I want you to be a part of it. And I said, no, 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 save that for me. <laughs> okay. And he did do um, a couple of pieces with other writers where there was a little chapter yes. because I was dean um, at a liberal arts college in Westchester County. And though I had talked about writing for 45 years, he really didn't believe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But 
finally he was on Gil Nobles Like It Is. Okay. And he was doing a story on, and he wanted to highlight someone and he had Jimmy on the program. And uh, the next day he was flooded with emails. They had said he was down at Borough Manhattan Community College. He was flooded with phone calls. And essentially the questions they were asked, and what happened next? You know, well, what happened to your sister? And what happened to your brother? It's and, so and amazing, and <laughs> this book is so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think also the, the, after the show, uh, a very elderly black woman from Harlem came down to my office, and she just stood out side of my office and I looked up and said, why don't you come in? She said, no, 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 son. She said, I just wanted to look at you. I saw the show mm -hmm. and I want to thank you for telling your story because your story is our story. Yes. And, it, and, I, and that sort of like got us interested in maybe trying to give this story out because it's mm -hmm. voice for the voiceless. It's, it's an opportunity for people who have gone through similar things as myself and who are still going through it today to see and hear and to know and to be able to identify with someone who has gone through a similar experience. Uh, one of the reviewers of the book, some gentleman, I don't know, said that after reading the book, he no longer felt alone. It's hmm. powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got about a minute left. Where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? Um, 30 seconds, and where do you go from here? I'm going to Hollywood. I hope you're taking best with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to, as a matter of fact, I am writing a book about Rosa Parks. Okay. Who was uh, a friend of mine and a uh, great lady, as you know. So that's what I'm doing. But seriously, Sam, I want to go to different agencies, especially those. We have about 20,000 kids in foster care. 4,000 of them being aged out every year and totally unprepared for society. Thank you very much for being on Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having us. I must admit, I skimmed the book. Mm -hmm. Now this weekend, I'm going to read this. <laughs> no, right. it, it, it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I got to meet God's bad boy. <laughs> and. Uh, the very beautiful Dr. Bessie Blake. Yo, we were happy to be Thank here. Thank you for having us. God's bad boy, Professor James Blake and Dr. Bessie Blake. President Obama said recently that 40% of our college students across America choose community colleges. Some are young and starting out, some are older and looking for a better job, some are veterans and single parents trying to transition back into the job market. How important is the president's proposal for community college students? That's the first question I'm posing to my guest, Dr. Harry Good from Kingsborough Community College. Thank you, well, it's extremely important. And the reason for that is to increase productivity of the overall workforce. And by making uh, the community college affordable, free if you will, uh, will make, will allow for uh, those either transcending into a new, uh, transitioning I should say, into a uh, profession uh, beyond what they already were trained to be in because those job areas have changed, or those just learning to uh, prepare themselves for, a, for positions that are in demand. It makes the overall economy more competitive, and it also allows for, it increases earning power over time, which oftentimes that factor goes missing because you can't, uh, you can't uh, uh, measure that until persons actually graduate the college and begin employment. But if you use past uh, generations, such as uh, after, per, prior to the war and after the war, when there was an enormous industrial transformation in this country, there was an intense need, because it was war, an intense need to train uh, the, the population for the current economy, which was a war-based economy. That's the long term. That's now let's look at the short term. Mm -hmm. uh, what he did say is that he wants them to be able to achieve what you just said without a load of debt. Okay. Let's talk about the debt problem. I mean, you, your position is faculty and enrollment management specialty. Correct. 
specialist. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know about the debt problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you're absolutely right on point there. Um, the, the debt issue causes students to not retain, that is, not to remain in the college. So they'll get a few courses, and if they get hit uh, economically, they leave. So now what do you have? You've already spent uh, financial aid money, which a good percentage of students at community colleges uh, receive, and uh, they don't complete the training process. So by making it free, at least the first two years of their training free, they can at least complete two years worth of training for a job that's uh, in, in need, in demand on the short term. And we talk about short term, we talk in a couple of years. Let's get back to the students. Mm -hmm. The plan announced by the president would provide tuition-free classes for going to school at least half time who maintain, and this is important, mm -hmm. a 2.5 GP or higher. Now, this is a problem. <laughs> that's a problem at many community colleges. Uh, it has a problem at the four-year colleges as well. But um, uh, first of all, he's letting them in. They're not coming in with a 2.0. And again, as you and I have discussed earlier before the show, is that math requirement is mm. making students more math proficient. Now that's somewhat of a math, that's somewhat of a student deficiency, but uh, uh, and a high school deficiency too. Uh, yes, that's correct. But unfortunately, we can't fix high school right now if we're looking short term. We got to try to fix at the college level what the high schools weren't able to fix. Sure. And uh, I'm very much a math person, being an, being an economist, and I have to do a lot of math as it relates to economics. And what I've what I do. I don't I'll just give you an example. I don't immediately go into calculation. I deal with the understanding of how math came into existence and specifically how it applies to business classes, management classes, and economics classes. And I get them comfortable with concepts first. Okay? And then when I get them comfortable with the concepts, I back into the calculation process. But if you start with all that abstract business, especially with numbers, and numbers are nothing but an abstraction. Letters are nothing but an abstraction because it represents something. And oftentimes, our mathematical system trains students to just calculate but not understand the situation that they're calculating for. And I want them to be comfortable with the situation first. And in fact, I want them to be so comfortable that they can create the formula. Go ahead. So you think the students can appreciate that you're trying to make it comfortable Correct. for them Correct. by readjusting the, the curriculum and therefore, in a sense, the, the real expectations. That's correct. Now, I don't want to bastardize um, the foundation of mathematics. I don't want to give them in, the impression that they've learned something that they just haven't. I'm still going to measure how well they are able to apply um, the calculation process to the situation that they've learned, that they've, they, they've become more comfortable with. And I still need to get them out of there in a semester to meet those short-term uh, outcomes. Let's talk about support services mm -hmm. that are, are going to allow the students to be able to get their, make the most of the two years, that, that two years free tuition. Correct. And you've been involved in support services for a long time. So let's talk about the support services okay. that are available at community colleges. Okay, prior to that I was the uh, coordinator for counseling, if you recall, for the college discovery program. Let me just share this with you, I shared this with you prior to this, our program here. Um, College Discovery and Seek throughout New York City is the most productive of all the programs across the curriculum. Why? Because the counseling factor is intense. And we not only counsel, we also teach, because sometimes to help the student appreciate what professors are going through, we have to actually mm, uh, go, uh, take them through the instructional side of being a student and why they have to be a little sensitive to having to focus, and, uh, and control some of their own uh, behavior. Behavior is a key piece in learning anything, okay? And focus is something we could easily say, but students come to the table with all sorts of issues. And oftentimes, focusing can be a challenge. That's why a teacher and a counselor has to be somewhat of an actor, as well as someone who can didactically lay the curriculum down. And it's boring as can be. We have to act it out. We have to show them pictures, draw pictures, create pictures, oftentimes pictures that are drawn from the environments in which they live in. Now we have a multi, we have a diverse classroom and we have to be able to draw those pictures accordingly. And go ahead. Yes, mm -hmm. one final question mm -hmm. and uh, that is about the president's reasoning. Mm -hmm. Many reasons he gave. Mm -hmm. But one is closing the country's well, what he termed as the growing wealth gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
If I could just use another gentleman's <laughs> point. Uh, he's a talk show host in D.C., and he says the new currency is education. Now, that's not new. The currency's always been education. I tell mm -hmm. students all the time, I said, now, you may have a skill that may bring you an enormous amount of wealth, but oftentimes, such as many of our uh, pro ball players, well, 80% of them lose that wealth by the time they leave the sport or shortly after leaving the sport. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they get the money and don't know how to manage the money, or they give the money to someone who just messes the money up for them. At least the education gives them a framework for understanding how that cash flow should be managed. At least they'll identify folks that will manage it more effectively than not knowing what the hell the accountant is doing. Muhammad Ali used to say all the time, I have an accountant watching the accountant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we make the money, but we better understand how money is both not just made, but how it's uh, it's accumulated and concentrated to do the kinds of things that we want to see our money do. We need to do that individually and collectively, and that can be learned through the education process, even if you're just stud studying English. It can, you don't have to necessarily be studying finance to understand how, um, how money works its way through the system. As long as you can read, then you can read your way through the process. We've discussed the president's stated wish for two years of college that would be as free and universal in America as high school is today. We'd like to hear from you. Post your comments on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. That's facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. Part two of this program will be about the economics of it all and how it would benefit students, specifically President Obama's plan to make the American Opportunity Tax Credit a permanent part of the tax code to increase the amount that could be refunded to taxpayers and make the credit available to students going to school at least half time and cover five years instead of four years of schooling. This is Brooklyn 45. Watch our new programs on YouTube and also visit our Facebook page and like us. On behalf of our team, I'm Sam Tate.